usually uh, this is a very exciting and buzzing time when we have all the startups coming over, getting ready for their pitches in a large hall, getting set up with the microphones, putting lights on stage. But now we are at home. I hope everybody is safe. Uh, I hope everybody has enjoyed their ride. Uh, everyone is adjusting, uh, and so have we. Um, I'll be exciting to moderate the session today. Uh, we'll have 17 startups. Not an easy number to handle, but we got a really good uh, roster of teams who had been working on their pitch for a while. And we also have a really cool uh, judging crew. So if Burak is here, Elif is here, would you want to introduce the judges or would you unmute the judges so they can introduce themselves real quick? Yes, we can um, uh, uh, introduce uh, and uh, all the judges one by one. Let me uh, uh, just a second make Marina uh, presenter and let her. All right, Marina, you are online now. Yes. Hi, everybody. Hi, I'm here calling in from London. I am a co-founder of a kid tech company here in London called Super Awesome. And today I specialize in advising and uh, mentoring um, early stage companies uh, across Europe um, in their ability to scale and build their teams. So super excited to be here and see the talent right across the ecosystem. So yay, let's go. Perfect, welcome. Also online and Berkay. Hey, Brock. <laughs> oh, this is uh, Barkai. Uh, I'm one of the founders of a startup uh, called Afshini that was acquired by. I'm Amal Piers, along with Vaidya and our advisors. We collectively bring experience in successfully scaling startups and global operations. Our team consists of investors and leaders from the industries of technology, logistics, banking, financial services, and insurance. Commercial enterprises and government institutions process 98 billion pages as of this year. This involves large teams to manually sort, enter and verify the information. Use of multiple tools depending on the input form and channel is cumbersome and expensive. Using Keto's simple to use modular learning platform, organization can now automate information extraction reliably with a smaller team. We reduce total cost of ownership by dealing with free-flowing documents in both digital and physical format for different industries and use cases. The global form processing market is around $10 billion and our current target market has an upside of $120 million. A large market research firm has validated the data for Keto. We plan to grab $11 million within five years with our specific use cases like invoice processing, accounts payable and receivable. Then go after the next $120 million space. We have a SaaS pricing model, pay per use. Our existing channel partners gives us access to logistics, BPO and financial services industry with their reach. Last year revenue was $90,000. Given the $180,000 contract already signed, we plan to end this year with $600,000. We are catering into automation companies, Government of India, BPOs, and accounting firms. We delivered Forex productivity for our customers while processing 2 million pages and 120,000 plus emails. Keto is looking to raise $1.5 million in the current round predominantly to boost the sales and marketing operations. We already have received commitments for the $700,000. This will help Keto reach operational profitability by October 21 and achieve a cumulative revenue of $1 million by the end of 2021. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, my quick question, if you can hear me, is about competition. Can you briefly tell us about the existing competitors uh, in the market? If Amal can hear us.
Nice. We can hear you. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so the existing competitors globally, uh, we have competitors like uh, HyperScience or Awesome in the US and European space. Uh, apart from that, we have Highland OnBase, which caters into all the spaces uh, which Keto is offering into as a platform. Uh, so for the startups who are in the space, they are uh, very niche, offers an invoice automation solution or an accounts payable solution. Uh, but when we look at the enterprise requirement, we need to cater into the entire uh, line of automation from email automation to other forms of data automation. So Keto, with its wide range of products in the platform, we are able to cater into the whole set of automation. So if you look at the Indian market, uh, we have uh, two specific players. One is a services company. So we look at the competition with respect to either the services firm or a product firm. So with respect to a services angle, we have a competitor known as Infrared, which were, which caters into the US and the Indian market. The Newgen is another competitor, which is in the BPM space, which has overlaps. Uh, we support Newgen in providing the data. So uh, uh, people talk about this as a competition, but it is a complementer. Uh, area of interest. All right. So Marina or Barkai, do you guys have any questions? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, wow, great to see that you're on track to profitability in 2021. Um, so what what does success look like, um, Keto, in um, the next three to five years? What do, if you guys can look back and say, we've really um, gained the traction that we expected, what would that look like? So. Uh, if you really gain the traction that we look like, Marina, uh, so if I sit in three years ahead and think about what we have achieved, uh, if you have really achieved it, we will be one of the uh, tech companies which would rise from the Indian ecosystem. Uh, we would have a solid, connected, competitive advantage. So already we are on way to that such an advantage. And at the same time, we would have a solid channel partnership uh, strategy in place. right? So, so we already are working with a lot of channel partners, so we would be able to scale that up. So that would help Keto to scale into multiple industries and multiple geographies faster. So within the next uh, three to five years, if you achieve that amount of revenue, uh, we would be positively in the side of one of the disruptors in the space. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Marina. Yeah, hi, uh, hi, Amal. Uh, my question is about uh, currently all the customers are in, are in India, I presume. Uh, what is your uh, if it wh where are the customers and what is your go to market model like how do you currently and in the near uh, to mid future plan to acquire the customers super question uh, uh, first of all thank you for the question uh, so our 5% of the customers from, are from the indian market 95% is from the us market uh, so our go to market consists of two uh, models we have a direct uh, sales channel which is driven by inbound marketing and we have a channel partnership model so we have already established solid channel partners who are mid-size uh, process engineering consultant firms who are run by senior executives or it would be large rpa companies uh, we have partners across europe uh, we have partners for canada we have partner for us and we have partner for singapore and hong kong so we were able to set that early traction of gaining the channel partners on board and each of them bringing in one or two customers along with them right so we are undergoing the production for these customers with the with these channel partners so uh, that would be a faster uh, approach for to scale into multiple markets and to ensure that a generic kind of a platform could reach the masses faster so that you gain that that also that would become indirectly a competitive advantage for the company what do you think will be the uh, the typical uh, customers uh, not now because it could be different right now as you're starting but like when you look ahead uh, typical ARR of a company uh, in the future, like the the ticket size or the, you know the invoice uh, annual revenue per customer, let's say. Uh, so forty thousand uh, dollars to fifty five thousand dollars per customer annual revenue, and okay. uh, uh, we have a couple of products in the bucket. So what we have seen, customers already sign up for more and more products as they scale within Keto. So they might be using initially an image automation platform which is uh, a generic platform and later they realize they need an email automation to work in parallel with that so they will purchase the email automation and they might pay another thirty thousand dollars more so we always have a scale of uh, up to two million dollars per customer arr uh, with respect to the whole suite of products which we cater into so we are in the early stage as you rightly mentioned we are in the early stage where we are catering at uh, around twenty thousand to thirty thousand dollars per customer oh, cool thank you yeah thank you thank you uh, Timothy, do you have any questions? 
And, uh, could, could you dig a little bit deeper into the user analytics? Like, so how many, on average, how many people are using your solutions in enterprises? Um, uh, how often are they using it? How engaged are they? This, this type of stuff. Uh, so in terms of the user analytics metrics, so many of the users are using it on a daily basis. It is replacing their current manual entry process. Uh, and we have an automated flow. Let's say 80% of the process could be an automated flow where there is no human intervention. And there could be a set of processes which requires critical human monitoring. That is the region where Keto plays a role. Uh, so all of our users are using it on a daily basis. It is their daily platform. So we need to have a really solid user experience and easy to use. So in terms of the number of customers who are already using it or number of users who are already using it, it's more than 1,000 users across customers at Timothy. Does that address uh, my, your question? And could you go a little bit into your specific, your Timothy. track specific to at, at this moment? Uh, how many customers do you have and what's, what's your revenue? So we have uh, five large enterprises already on board. Three of them have already completed production. Uh, we have another five more customers who are in the POC stage with us. And all these enterprises are mid, mid to large size enterprises, more than $100 million revenue kind of companies. Hello, but, Timothy? Yeah, but that's not your revenue. Uh, in the, the company, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, ticket, uh, the company end customers, uh, uh, kind of a size of the company which we look at, right? So the size of the company has to be relatively larger for, uh, yeah, for a product. Yeah, product like Keto makes sense for them. Yeah. And your year end, year end revenue target is around a million dollars? No. Uh, Six hundred thousand dollars for the current year. Uh, so. We are making it uh, realistic for the year because of a lot of scenarios which are happening around the world. Uh, there is a slow, uh, the pace has become uh, a bit slower in the industry uh, across. So the deal size has re reduced, the size of the deal has reduced. Uh, even at this scale, we do have uh, existing uh, customers who are working with us who are ready to sign up to that kind of a volume. Uh, apart from that, uh, we do have government of India who has completed our initial uh, POC, and they are also looking for a larger deal. So we haven't considered Government of India for our projections yet, uh, because it, it has a longer and larger uh, process so because the, of that. In, yeah, of course, government sales is different. So yes. we have to move to the next startup. But thank Absolutely. you so much for the answer. Thank you, thank you, Osan. Thank you, great, great to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Next. What you see is what you get. Well, it's true in the digital world, but what you see is what you do not get. It's true in the construction world. As an architect, I can tell you that the plan of the building does not reflect the building that has to be constructed. In fact, our clients, 34% of them, they're not satisfied with the type of building visualization they are provided. That's where we come in. We are Neymar, believing if you experience good, you can build even better. We visualize the buildings in real time, on scale, on the site. Just by taking your smartphone camera on the site, you can view the buildings in 3D or in the site office, just point it towards the building plan or just wear the VR headset and interact through the building. We are targeting the construction builders, the architects, as well as the interior furniture providers. And what do they get out of us? The construction builders, they can sell their buildings quicker and they can sell their buildings more expensive. And we have a proven record of trying to with that. Our competitors in Pakistan do not have the interactive visualization. Those doing it abroad take a lot of time because first they have to document the whole site in 3D and then project the building. Our business model is very simple B2B with the construction builders of which we have had 10 clients and 18,000 in revenue. With the construction societies, the townships, we have had four clients and 17,000 in revenue and our goal is to become a central platform for all sorts of real estate visualization. In 12 months, with 14 clients and 35,000 revenue, our journey uh, briefly from the soft launch in April 2019 to June 20, we have already collaborated with one of the central platforms in Pakistan and with 28% monthly growth, keeping Pakistani local market 130 million in mind. If we expand to the global market, even in Middle East, which is $26.3 billion, and the market is growing exponentially, we hope to achieve 840,000 revenue in two years from now. The team consists of architects, software developers, and salespeople. And the advisory board has immense experience in sales and marketing. I, as an architect and my co-founder, we have the eye to see how the building should look like while it has to be sold. 
how the problem of the people who have visualization issues need to be solved. With $180,000, if we have been given, we can spend it on marketing, uh, product development, operations, and expansion. Expansion in other cities and countries. And uh, by product, I mean we will add new features in the product. Thank you very much. Okay, that was nice. Big sector, uh, always problematic. Haven't truly converted to digital or um, cloud even. So Mohammed is online. Can we hear you? Mohammed, are you unmuted? Nope. I think now. Can you? Can you? Yes, perfect. So, by the looks of it, Barkay has a question already. <laughs> so, go for it. Yeah, I can start. Uh, can Can you uh, share like uh, what's the price of the product that you're selling, and is it a one-time sale or is it a like a recurring revenue subscription type sale? What is the model that you're using? The costing criteria is per square area. And we get the construction builders on board who have recurring projects. So uh, some of them get subscription model with us and the others who only have one or two projects, they can pay us per square area. Per square area. How much what are they paying per square area? Okay, so if you have one project, the customers are paying for one project and the price criteria is per square area for example per square foot in pakistan per square meter in turkey okay let's say us dollars xyz per square meter in turkey so this is the basic pricing criteria but for those builders who have recurring projects who have three to four or ten projects going on and you know all around the world so they get a subscription model that's mostly quarterly or annually we so need they a number for... like we, yeah we're trying to you know i'm trying to uh, understand the size of the market so like how much you're making from a what particular customer okay, okay. and then so, how many of those customers there are so from an average customer which takes around one week to 10 days to complete we are getting around ten thousand dollars per customer and for those who are giving us uh, the annual subscription they are paying us monthly for example let's say five thousand monthly perfect that's the answer we were looking for thank you so much marina timothy do you guys have any other questions yeah hi mohammed um so yeah this is a uh, a, a new space, uh, for, but it's a, already a fairly established um, competitors. What's going to help you guys compete? What's special about your product? Um, what's special about your expertise as well? Because I didn't note a lot of technology expertise in there. How are you? Okay. How are you tackling that? So competition in Pakistan is not very strong, uh, despite being a population of over two hundred and fifty million. The, uh, the technology is not very common. So in Pakistan, we don't have much competitors except two major competitors in other cities. As far as the Middle East market is concerned, which is our next target, they're, uh, they're using the basic 3D visualization. Like they're doing the 3D views and animations and some sort of the virtual reality. But getting your building visualized on the actual construction site, either it's very, very time consuming because their processes are long. So they take one week to first document the whole site and then put it there. In our product, the technology allows you to just take your smartphone camera to the site and you can see the building already there without any prerequisites. So in the international market, we are saving in terms of time. So what others are providing, let's say in, in one month, we are providing that in one week. Is that because of your technology or what is it allows you to do that? The technological process. The other countries, uh, the other companies, uh, they do first, they document the whole construction site, which takes a lot of 3D equipment and a lot of cost and a lot of time. And then they let you visualize. In our case, just with the apps, just with the camera and some features in the phone, you can just go to the site and view it there. So that is the difference. Okay, and are, is, does your pricing model uh, reflect different levels of like, okay, the first time you go to site and it's a sort of an example of what might be there versus later when the plans are really established and you've kind of gone a bit deeper to guarantee it's going to be there? Like, how have you managed that challenge? Or do you so price for I that? Uh, our pricing model uh, has three different categories for the construction builders who have the high rise to mid rise projects. And then there are townships like those who are developing the whole cities and townships. So the pricing model for the construction builders are for each project and for those townships, uh, basically all our customers, they use this product to sell it 
to their customer so that the building is not yet built this product is used to sell the real estate which is not already there so it's sort of value addition for them they can sell it quickly because their customer can visualize it what it is going to look like after it has been constructed on the actual site all right so <laughs> if timothy if you have a pressing question you can jump in or if not we will move to the next one i am good thanks perfect thank you so much mohammed good luck thank you next we're going to have eat ever Hello, I'm Debrina from Itaver. Itaver is a website that connects and manages caterers in providing halal meals to corporates and events in Indonesia. So far, average value per transaction at Itaver is $100. Our sales in 2019 has reached $200,000, which is growing 257% compared to last year's sales. Itaver was founded on July 2017 by Dian Widayanti and I. Ian is a halal food influencer with expertise in sales and marketing, while I have experience in product development as I led a team who launched Ruangguru apps at its initial launching. Ruangguru is the biggest ad tech startup in Indonesia right now. So, Itaver is trying to solve problems among corporates who are unable to reach affordable and quality caterers and among caterers who are unable to reach full production capacity, lack of branding, or find difficulty to get halal certification as Indonesian government requires all products sold in Indonesia are halal certified starting 2019. During COVID-19 pandemic, we also found new problems in the market. Most people are working from home and they should manage their time well between working and family. That's why we launched new products that are frozen ready meals that will help and that will become a solution for women, especially working mom. Our target customers are daily catering for corporate and retail and also corporate and events and individual events too. We choose to serve halal food because the global halal food market is expected to grow $600 billion in 2023. Next, we want to help caterers to scale up their business by providing tools that are operational management system dashboard that will help them to pass halal certification or other food safety certification. That's why we need $150,000 investment. Thank you. I think Debrina will be here as well. Uh, beautiful country, uh, amazing market. Uh, maybe I'll kick off the questions by asking, how are you going to go global, uh, or are you planning to go anything to do anything outside of Indonesia? Okay, uh, we we are planning to go Malaysia and Brunei. Uh, for for and we will selling frozen food first because it's hot in the market right now and we see that uh as the southeast asian market especially malaysia and brunei also also care about halal food too so b2c or retail retail first retail first okay yeah um marina or Barkai or Timothy. Yeah, hi Debrina, thanks for the nice presentation. Uh, just in terms of kind of longer term vision, how, how would you define success uh, three to five years down the road from now for your company? For my company, uh, when we can help many, many caterers in Indonesia, especially to get halal certification, because right now only less than 10% of FNB industry, F F FNB industry in Indonesia that get halal certification, <coughs> and our government requires uh, all FNB industry will uh, to get halal certification in two thousand 
24 maximum. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and how would you define your growth goals? Uh, you know, what size would you like to be in, in a few years down the road? What, what are your goals? Sir? In terms of revenue, how big of a yeah. revenue yeah. are you getting? Yeah. Revenue. revenue. Okay. In five years. We just expect from the top of your head. Yeah, okay. just, just long-term goals. Like, w w what would you say? Okay, you know, I want to get to X amount of revenue uh, in two years or three years, or it, it doesn't have to be a, a specific timeline. We want to get uh, six, sorry, six million, sorry, sixty million dollar uh, in two thousand until two thousand twenty-two. So okay. two years, yeah, sixteen million dollars of revenue, one six. Yeah, okay. one six. Okay. Because just, we will, we will yeah, because we will get, uh, we will provide new new line of product, not only. That's okay. Yeah, we just wanted to make sure of the number, like six versus sixteen or sixty. Uh, those, that's that's the uh, perfect. Yeah. Oh, sure. yeah. Okay. Thank. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So if Marina or Barkai doesn't have any questions, I think they already had lunch, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, guess, I guess really just to, like what are the challenges gonna be, Debrina, to get into that 16 million? What are, what are the number one things that you guys need to overcome to get there? The challenge? Yeah, what do you guys, what do you think will uh, be the challenges that you face as you start to grow and scale and expand? That you can over, but you can overcome them, right? But what are they? <laughs> so if there's there's a risk, there are challenges, there are things that you need to fight over. What are the primary problems that you will see in the future? The problems is uh, the primary problems most likely will come from the small medium enterprise itself yeah. because uh, many SMEs in Indonesia has not familiar with halal assurance standard first so we need to educate them first okay. so educating the market is a big challenge and once you educate yeah. them then they can onboard much easily okay then, perfect uh, anything else uh, I think to overcome that, uh, we will partner up with the government, like Ministry of Religion in Indonesia. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure you'll find many ways to overcome that. Big debate, mm -hmm. long tail market, uh, but good luck. Thank you so much for your presentation. Okay. All the you. best to Indonesia. Thank you, Hosan. You're welcome. So going to our next pitch. We will have uh, Upskillable. Hello, my name is Dr. Tagreed Al Saraj. I'm the CEO and co founder of Upskillable. What is Upskillable? Upskillable is a virtual assessment platform that predicts personnel performance. Uh, when my co-founders and I were brought in to lead teams at our organization, we found that some of our team members were not capable of doing the job that they were originally hired to do. So we found that hiring through traditional method is subjective, prone to bias and inefficient, which often led to poor hire. Uh, and that is when Upskillable was born. We wanted to hire people based on merit. So we developed a platform that uh, assesses candidates on their cognitive ability, domain specific skills and personality and brings it and brings uh, and comes up with a job fit score. This is an example of how our platform would look like that has a job, a job fit score. We also have the capability to compare candidates uh, with according to their scores. Our target market is the UK GCC, and we have partners in Asia Pacific, as well as we're looking to expand in North America. The global online assessment service is about $4.2 billion. 
Uh, as you can see, we are situated in the market as per the graph at minimal customer and investment as well as multi-dimensional assessment. But our competitive advantage is that we have an engine that allows companies to develop their own skills assessment if they wanted to. We also have a pre-screening engine uh, to filter candidates. We also are adding video interviewing, which component that is going to be coming soon. We acquire customers through online direct sales and channel partners. Uh, these are some of the, the companies that we've worked with. Uh, we, uh, this is the projected revenue based on one deals for 2020. We have a diverse and international team, founding team. Uh, our revenue for this year is gonna be $904,000 based on 8,000 assessments sold. Uh, we're looking to raise $1 million uh, and this will go towards marketing, sales, and Perfect. That was nicely timed. It's good. So uh, one question on the revenue. How much is your revenue now? Uh, we already signed deals of 904000 and it is going to be, there's an option of adding more features. So there is uh, there's a possibility of even more than 900 but 900 is signed. So 900 as of June, you have oh, so by, by the end no by the end of december we will have nine hundred and four thousand. okay how much do you have now like i'm just uh, trying to see the growth rate to help uh, you yes, show uh, how fast you're growing uh, i think by now we should be um in the graph i think it showed that it's about um uh, uh give me a rough number around like yeah, I think it's uh, because it's a monthly payment, so That's it's okay. broken down. Yeah. That's okay. So Just tell me the monthly recurring revenue. Uh, the monthly recurring revenue is it's going to be uh, around now. It's over over a hundred thousand around that. Okay. But uh, the thing is that there's some projects that is cost plus. So okay. that is uh, that's when the amount can expire one month opposed to the other. Right, because the investors that are going to be asking questions, tell them the numbers they want to hear. MRR going with 10% okay. overall. Maybe okay. that will be one question I saved from Barakai or Marine or Timothy. Do you guys have any other questions? Yeah, could you talk a little bit about the customer breakdown? So how many customers do you have? Um, where are they from? How much are they paying? This, this type of thing. Okay, so we have now currently around uh, six customers uh, because uh, it's maybe the number is low, but it's big projects that we're working mm -hmm. on. Some of them are semi-government as well in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so that's why, um, that's why the, the high uh, revenue coming in. Mm -hmm. And what's the percentage of the revenue that's uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia compared to other countries? Uh, currently, it's all Saudi Arabia. Okay. The whole amount okay. is coming from Saudi Arabia. Okay. Great, thanks. Thanks. Marina, I think you had a question. Yeah, hi, um, thank you. So what's the kind of bigger vision here? What do you, what do you, what do you guys want to say that you're accomplishing or your kind of vision or mission for this business and this technology? Uh, well, our, our, um, we, we came together on a mission to, hire, to get people in jobs based on merit, not about who you know or, uh, or uh, your CV. So that is our mission. We want to be the go-to SaaS, a global SaaS platform uh, that encumbers all, all of this uh, scientifically. Okay, and so today, well, how will your product change from where it is today in terms of the types, of, your ability to provide that like a bit, like uh, technology to really test? Um, like, will you be investing in more behavioral psychology and developing tools to really get to the the, the kind of pinpoint like how to really test for different skills and being the, the, the experts in that or how, how will your technology Yeah, evolve? so we are already one of the unique uh, SaaS platforms that has the skills uh, assessment uh, and we also have it in Arabic, dual languages, which is rare that you would have skills assessment in Arabic. So that we already have that capability. 
so we we are focusing on the technology sector now, but we can expand according to the market needs. Uh, so we assess uh, uh, in that in that in that field. So we have that capability to grow. Will your Thank technology you. need to change as you as you grow as you grow and to, to be the market leaders or how do you think the tech is there? Like what does the, the, the uh, no? I don't think that the tech needs to change. It's actually add more. So we're that's why the investment we're seeking is to add more. We need to develop faster and we need to add more features into the system to the platform. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. All the best to Saudi as someone who lived there and loved it. Thank you. Mabruk. Shukran. All right. Next, we're going to have Skuma. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm ready to bet, I'm ready right, to bet here, right, right here, right now, that you have bought but you bottle water in the past week. In the past or week. at least thought. Or at least thought. Now, imagine a now world where the bottled water industry simply did not exist. A world where every single person would use tap water to hydrate themselves. But the real question is, why do people still buy bottled water? If we really think about it, tap water is free. So what makes water in a plastic container so appealing to customers? Now more than ever, with all this all COVID-19 epidemic, people are scared of even bringing the smallest piece from the exterior into their homes. I even witnessed my grandmother three days ago disinfect the water bottles that were that she bought from the local commerce. What if I told you there's a device out there that transforms the tap water from any country, no matter the contamination, into purified water with the exact same mineral composition as famous brands like Evian or Volvic? Would that be enough to dissuade you from buying bottled water? In simple terms, our solution, Skuma, is the soda stream for mineral water. Skuma establishes trust between the user and their local supply of tap water. This device has been gaining traction month over month, adding to a list of pre-orders close to 200, as well as support from many different institutions all over the world. A couple of weeks ago, we even closed our pre-seed round of funding from a Hong Kong-based water purification company for an amount close to £100,000. Water mineralization has gained huge momentum in the past two to three years with brands like Meat, Roche and Lang. Unfortunately, all these brands and all these devices cost about the £500 mark and focus their marketing on upper middle class households. This limits their commerciality, especially on an international scale. Skuma's goal is to encourage the use of tap water all over the world. And especially in countries with that have high dependency on bottled water, such as the UK, and then progressing slowly into Middle East, as well as Asian markets. We plan on launching our crowdfunding by September 2020, in order to pre-sell 1,250 units. We also are in talks with major retailers, such as John Lewis and Ikea. Our core team is composed of two mechanical engineers, George and myself, and is supporting, supported, being supported by a marketing team composed of Mamun, Rui and Arabella. Additionally, we have a board of highly uh, qualified advisors, our, our industry leading professionals from uh, academia as well as professional companies. We now need your support to help us increase our reach and pre-order list. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello, hello, Yunus. So time the product in a time the I cannot market. hear you very well. Yes, hello. Hello? Yes, Ozan can hear Good. you. Good. Good, perfect. So Timothy, do you want to start this one? Hello, you, Timothy. Are you... Yes, I think we can hear him now. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, can you yeah. can you go a little bit into your margins? Uh, what they what they look like? Of course, yes. Good question. So basically, we are looking to pre-sell. So we have three different packages. The initial starter pack is 125 pounds. So I failed to mention a bit this in the presentation, but we're focusing in the UK since it's Europe's second uh, consumer of bottled water. So 125 pounds for the starter <coughs> pack, and the margin on the on the device itself is about 55 percent and the cartridge. So we will be selling the cartridge with the subscription model based also on what Ozan had told us the other mm -hmm. time uh, with a, a profit margin of uh, 72%. Uh, 
a bit more than 70% on the cartridge. And you, the user needs to change the cartridge every six months. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you mentioned also that you have a kind uh, investor who had committed to a pre-seed round who's also in this industry. H how do you see kind of this partnership? Um, how do you see working together? Because they sound like a bit of a strategic investor, you could say. Of course, yes. So that was the, the major reason why we went through with, with this deal. Mm -hmm. It actually, it's it, it gone through. And basically, so he, he has been, his name is Tony, he has been working with water purification systems for the past 10 years in Hong Kong with a B2B sort of uh, uh, market approach. And he has helped us in the past two months, we're, we're, we're already working with him. He helped us bring this idea from simple CAD and rendering and the idea into uh, something that is manufacturable. So that's mm -hmm. how what we're working at the moment with him. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Marina, are you going to spend 150 pounds on this? Well, here I am with my soda stream bottle. A big fan of spending money on nice water. No, so yeah, I maybe. Think it's a bad sign. <laughs> Um, maybe. Um, so, uh, I like the model. I mean, I, I've definitely bought into it with SodaStream. Um, so what does what are your goals for growth in the next three years uh, and how are you going to get there? Of course, I anticipated this question from your questions with the previous startups. So basically what we're looking at is, uh, so we're launching in September, hopefully by this September uh, on Kickstarter, uh, 1000 units. So it will be a net revenue by the end of the year of 150,000 pounds. We're looking for 2021 to go into more of a retail space uh, with our partners in at John Lewis. So it's, it's more promising with a figure about 600,000 pounds by the end of 2021. And then what we want to do is eliminate this all over the world and not have people buy bottled water. Um, just to give some more in, information. Uh, no, we don't have looking... for, for more information. Okay, Thank so you. then we're looking <laughs> at, uh, at about uh, 5 million by, by uh, the end of the, of the third year of, of business. Okay. Thank you. A really quick question. How are you yeah. going to ensure you, your competitors don't come in on your pricing model? Of course, yes. Good question. So the, the way the technology has been done, we are the only ones who are able to uh, exactly have the formulation. So how much minerals is in the water that is being dispensed? Uh, when we did, we did a couple of uh, surveys with consumers in London, down in uh, Liverpool Street. And something we noticed is we were asking, how do you, uh, how do, are you sure that the bottled water is more safe than, for example, the water out of your Brita in the okay. UK? And okay. the consumer said, we can see there is a label, there is the minerals in it. So they attach this idea to purity and uh, sort of exact composition of, of minerals. Yeah, I mean, I would I would mention that it's, it's quite good. Yeah, in, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Barkai, would you be drinking tap water in Istanbul or in Ankara with skuma? It's possible. Oh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's possible. I mean, it uh, it is a big. Uh, problem to uh, to constantly it's not just uh, as you know in in, in Turkey uh, not just bottled water but we buy all the water that we drink from outside yeah. and it's constant constant uh, struggle to do that uh, we did use soda stream in the past uh, when I was in US so it is certainly a possibility to do so all right well, so you have a market you need to Perfect. start sending discount coupons to the partners and judges so they can pre-buy the crowdfunding. <laughs> Thank you. One, one thing I would say is that uh, in, in your next presentation, you may want to talk about what is your go-to-market model? Like, is it direct uh, e-commerce? Like, who are you going to sell? Like, uh, your margins will be usually impacted by how, how you do that, right? Like, the, if it, it, it is, I assume that you assume it's 55% if you're selling direct to the customer. Yeah. Uh, that, you know what is your customer acquisition cost? Like there is a lot, a lot more, more to, to that that may impact your whether you can sell in that price point or not. Like at least you, you may want to talk about those. Of course. Thank you. Very good feedback. Thank so you. Next will be card goers. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Taj, co-founder of Cardgoers. Our team of co-founders has launched many successful startups in different sectors. 
One of them is prefabrics of modular construction, which made more than $5 million of exports to 14 countries in three years. We have fully dedicated technical teams, three of them are engineers and one with marketing in Baghdad. Cargo is an essential component and enabler of cross-border e-commerce, and the limitations of existing cargo companies, such as delays, high fees, and limited geographical coverage, is opening more opportunities for new digital business models. Considering that we have 4 billion travelers every year, our idea was to build a system where people can shop and send their personal cargo using travelers as carriers. Let's take an example. Rather than paying $300 to buy a suit in Qatar, Salem decided to purchase it from Altin Yelda's website in Turkey for only $80. He posted his request on Cargoers, which found him matches for people traveling from Istanbul to Qatar and offering space in their luggage. He agreed with Mehmet as he offered best price and delivery time, and he got his suit delivered to him by Mehmet at a very competitive rate. Now, what if Salem couldn't find a match? In this case, Cargoers offered Salem to purchase the item on his behalf and get it delivered to him through traditional cargo companies. The global B2C e-commerce market size was valued at $3.3 trillion in 2019 and expected to grow at 8% annual rate till 2027. Despite these huge figures, still only 4 to 10% of total sales is done online in developed countries. Now we will be targeting MENA region and start with Turkey and Gulf countries where we have both connections and experience. Our target market will be frequent online shoppers who have middle and high income and frequent travelers who make more than three trips a year and less than 50 years old. Cargoers is a win-win user-friendly application that gets its income only as a percentage of successful transactions. Our main competitors are one to five years old startups that are not focusing on MENA region. Our first version is tested and ready for launching as of 1st of July, and we need about $600,000 of financing that will be spent on marketing and expanding our team. Thank you very much for your time. So, thank you so much, Mehmet, for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Marina, Barkay, or Timothy? We can, yeah, okay. Good job. Advantage over other players in the space. Sorry, we couldn't get the voice. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Usually used to Zoom. <laughs> but, uh, uh, what, what would you say your competitive advantage over other players in this space is? You know, how do you see your USP? Your... Right. Actually, we are focusing and uh, we've analyzed our competitors. They are working in different uh, regions. We are focusing mainly on the main region where we don't have until now a direct competitor who is operating under the same idea. So we are also adding uh, different features on our system. We are offering alternative shipping, you know, uh, ways. So even, uh, let's say, considering the current situation where travelers' numbers uh, is declining uh, because of the recent, you know, uh, COVID-19, we've uh, introducing also an alternative where you can uh, ask cargo cargoers to shop the item for you and get it delivered through the traditional, you know, shipping companies. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you very much. So if Marino or Barakai, if you guys don't have any questions, it's a good model, proven somewhere else. Hope it works yeah. in Turkey and Middle East and going forward. We hope so. Thank you very much. Good luck. Ah, Marina, you have a yeah. question? Well, really just to ask um, who liability will sit with and how you can manage around that um, and how that scales. Sorry, <laughs> can you please repeat it again? We're going to get the um, beginning of the question. The liability part, who owns the responsibility to deliver, to make sure it's delivered, the traditional problem? Well, actually, the model is built to guarantee that everybody, you know, gets uh, his responsibility for his part. 
So uh, let's say if if sender asks the carrier to carry a product, then he is him to shop it for him. So a carrier will pay for the item. We will make block on the credit card of the sender to guarantee that the money will be in our position until the duty of the carrier is you know uh, completed. So in this case, we are guaranteeing both sides will be protected. Over. Okay. And it's a platform. Do you guys have a, what's that? No, wait. I think there's a background uh, noise. Yeah. Is it a is it a platform that will then plug into the like the shopping basket of uh, for delivery choice if I choose cargo or or is it like I want to get something from a local shop and now I'm calling cargo and they're going to manually go and do it? It's a mobile application platform that uh, you can send uh, the request anything from any place or any country you want and the travelers from that country will shop it for you and bring it to the location you want to deliver it in it so you only post the link of the item and the, the carrier will buy it and uh, carry it okay thank you so much guys good luck appreciate it thank you next is Westrade. Hello everyone, my name is Sherpool. I'm the co-founder of Street. We are building securities exchange based on blockchain. So we have found three problems so far in uh, the financial market, especially in stock exchange. The first one is stock exchange inefficiency in terms of transaction settlement, uh, like the settlement cycle for the uh, stock exchange is like T plus two or T plus three. I think it's way too long for the investors uh, and we want to do that uh, instant transaction settlement. The second one is SMS financing gap. We found that there's a 2.6 trillion financing gap in the uh, in SMS and startup funding. And the third one is the access to high quality project. Uh, for the individual investors, it's quite hard to find a uh, high quality project uh, as we know that they only have a small amount of money so that's very hard to invest in high quality project so uh we come up with a solution that we want to make digital securities exchange and prop funding in one platform uh, we also pick the best uh projects in our platform to make sure the uh investor gain the best return uh, so how is it possible uh we want to make the transaction without intermediaries uh we are Going to make blockchain as a blockchain, uh, as a custody uh, by doing peer-to-peer -peer transaction. Every transaction settled in users' wallet directly, and uh, we are quite confident with our market size since we know that there's a 77.5 trillion uh, yearly trading volume on global stock exchange. And uh, here is our product. The first one is the Facebook trading platform. And second one is security token offering. It's like a launchpad, but for the SME and the startup. So uh, we will tokenize the SME stocks. So what about the business plan? Uh, we will get we will generate revenue from trading fee. It's like zero point two trading per trade, and we also will charge commission for the SME who uh, raise money in our platform. And this is the company's advantage uh, comparing with the other exchanges. Our main rival is the stocks exchanges, uh, which have which they have a very expensive fee compared to us is only 0 0.2. And our listing requirement is not too complicated, uh, not too complicated. And here's our team uh, and the CEO and Istana GB as CFO and Bahamut Albert as CTO. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, tough market, lots of competition. Whoever has the largest cryptocurrency uh, portfolio of the three of you, dear judges, should ask the first question. That's and not me, then. So <laughs> I'll hand it over to someone else. Oh, by the way, we don't have the 
Oh, we have Sayufu. Okay, he's coming in. All right, go for it. Okay, so basically, uh, we are uh, building the primary market first. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I was talking to you. <laughs> Calm down. You already had too much of a presentation. So be yeah. sharp and precise in your answers, please. Okay. Timothy. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just going to ask. Uh, so it, it also seems like you want to tokenize other assets like real estate. And correct me if I'm wrong, but what's the thought process? Like, like why do we need tokenization of real estate for example what, what's your what's your argument for this yeah basically it will work for the rent so uh people want who wants to buy the houses uh they can do uh like installment like you can pay tw uh 20 per 20 years uh of rent but it's like installment so and and the profit will be uh divided to the owners of the token mm -hmm. And what's the what's the thought process though behind like there are other ways of like structuring vehicles for investment in real estate. Uh, yeah. But I've also heard this kind of argument for tokenization from other people too. So you're not alone. But what's what's your opinion? Why do why should we tokenize real estate or other assets? Yeah, because uh, I think the ownership for the token uh, for the uh, property is. A very, very. Oh, I, I think it's not uh, too good. So we can divide the ownership. Why not? Uh, we can audit uh, collectively. If you, if we want to invest in property, but it's way too uh, pricey, it's expensive. So we can divide them in, into smaller accounts and uh, sell it in uh, cheaper version of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's distributing the market in an efficient way. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. So, if we can, no other questions, we can move to Care Socius. Thank you, Seifel. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah. My uncle lived in a small village in Morocco and was diagnosed with cancer after stomach pain. I found him a specialist in Germany, but the way to a second diagnose and the corresponding treatment planning has taken too much time. He died two years ago in Morocco. Our solution consists of three tools. First tool is our patient expert guide. Second tool is our management and support solution for international offices with an add-on onboarding plugin for hospitals and joint doctor offices websites. The market volume in the medical travel industry is 45 billion US dollars and is progressively increasing due to telehealth technology. Patients will only travel if they are sure that it makes sense and clinics only accept patients if they believe that they can help. The first amazing product we have released two weeks before the crisis is a digital and secure mobile application for health travelers with an integrated medical record that empowers and supports health travelers before, during and after the journey. The market is complex, yes, but can be penetrated with an investor with experience in marketing and B2B sales. We are currently focusing on exclusive contracts with the largest hospital groups in Europe and the Middle East and see as well a great, a great potential for travel insurances in our product. We have a lot of indirect competitors with all these health travel agencies, but see that as an added value for future development. Our direct competitors who want to position themselves in the medical tourism sector in Europe, Medigo and, and Kona Medical, which do not focus on prevention, aftercare or on secure medical case exchange. We offer second opinions on medical cases with a specific country prices. We sell our onboarding module for 200 US dollars per month and the corresponding management and support solution to hospitals and international offices for 800 US dollars per month. In this way, treatment requests or second opinion requests from abroad can be systematically standardized. Apart from IT security and software development know-how, we attach great importance to be a global marketing channel for our partners at global scale. Here you can see our amazing team, 
and our advisory board. We offer you a unique opportunity to invest in a cross-industry platform that will shape the future of digital health. We are seeking 800,000 US dollars. Thank you very much and stay healthy. Test, test. Thank you so much, Mohammed, for the presentation. You're welcome. Marina. Yeah, thank you, Mohammed. Um, so you guys are still quite early, right? Exactly, exactly. Quite early and uh, didn't touch the right moment with Corona. Okay, yeah. Um, so what's your, what market are you going after? Like right now, I hear the second opinion market. Mm -hmm. Is that the focus or where, how is this going to scale? Exactly. So our main focus was, uh, um, was the patient in itself. So after the Corona crisis, um, we switch it to B2B. So really, we want to sell our, our management and support solution to um, hospitals so they can position their specialists and uh, are focusing on um, second opinion, as you mentioned it. Um, is that coming from the market, that, like, that uh, requirement? Or is it something you're assuming the market should, should need? Like what, what are your, what, what are your the kind of key drivers? So I didn't understand your question really well, but the key drivers are, so it's depending the market. So let, if, if, you, if you focus on the, middle, on the Middle East region, they want to position themselves as a hub of medical tourism. But um, to get these customers is quite expensive and they come in from different channels. So in hosp at hospital level, they have often international offices, which really focus on, on, on a mixture between marketing and uh, acquisition. So our solution helped them to standardize these uh, these these uh, inter uh, these patient acquisition and managing these um, international patients in hospitals. And you have some users right now. What kind of uh, metrics do you have at the moment? Mm -hmm. So the, we don't have. That's the point. Um, we positioning ourselves um, as a non medical agency. That means that we don't. Um, uh, um, positioning ourselves as a, as a patient mediator, how, uh, how it calls. So um, we launched our product, so the patient application, so this guidance application, um, two weeks before the crisis. So um, we ha don't really have a, a, a high number of users, but we have customers, and these customers are not really coming in from uh, our mobile application, more, more from our internal network that we have with hospitals and with patient agencies, which uh, have customers who want to have a treatment in Switzerland, in Germany or in Austria. So before the treatment, what we do is that with our application, they uh, get a second opinion call with a chief physician. And then accordingly, if the hospital accepts um, that the patient can be treated in the hospital, then we manage. The okay. Patient. Well, what insights have you gotten from your KPIs? What kind of growth have you seen, even in that small user base? What, what are you um, what traction you seen? We see more traction on the user base. At 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 uh, as we as mentioned, we focus really on B two B sales. So um, we want to achieve that uh, that our eighty partners, eighty partner hospitals, really use our application. And for that, we need uh, we need the time and of course revenue to really um, sell our product. As, uh, as we are a small team and to have a strong focus on development, um, we, we need uh, to implement these software solutions in hospitals. And that is our, our biggest issue at the moment. So we have three major partners, which we focus at the moment in Switzerland. It's a, it's a hospital here in the Mirian Iselin Clinic. And, um, and we are working with them to implementing the software solution in a, the first software solution in a real Swiss hospital as we, as we focus it in the past really on, on not on the Swiss or the Dach market, so German, Austria, we focus it on the Middle East. Okay. But, but after so, the crisis, we needed to. Well, the, the crisis is going to change a lot of in healthcare, and mm. maybe you are in the right time, right place. Maybe, so, maybe, yeah. <laughs> inshallah. <laughs> exactly. So we're running out of time with the Q&As, and I'm trying to limit the time we are going to leave the sessions, but I know Timothy is from Austria, and maybe this is one of the tech techie techs that you'd like to have a question or Barkai, if this is an area of interest, if you have any questions. If not, well, we can move to. I think at my end, no questions here. Hi, okay. Yeah, yeah.
Thank you. Thank you. So now we're moving ahead with crowd poll. Hello, guys. Hello. My name is Zaid Khalil, and I'm the CEO of CrowdPoll. And I'm obsessed with facts, numbers, and data ever since I was working on my master's dissertation. I was trying to collect data about the consumer behavior in Palestine, but the data was not there. So I tried to benchmark Palestine to other countries in the region. The data was not there also. And I found out that in the MENA region, I was not the only person, business, or organization who's facing that problem. In the MENA region, SMEs and NGOs have limited budgets for market research. And they need this data to have better business decisions. And collecting them through traditional market research agencies are, is too expensive and time consuming. In addition to the fact that the COVID-19 has changed the data collection method once and for all. And for us at CrowdPoll, we're trying to change the status quo. CrowdPoll is a platform giving users the opportunity to provide constant feedback to businesses share their opinions in now and in the future and get rewarded for that. As for NGOs and SMEs, they get the chance to evaluate their products and services and offering and adjust them and upgrade them based on the feedback they get and anticipate future trends. And this is how it works. You download the app, you scroll through topics and surveys, answer those surveys, get points and redeem them. It's that simple. The market is huge. 85% of the business sector in Palestine is SMEs. And the NGOs in Palestine alone are spending $130 million annually, out of which $6.5 million are spent on market research. And we're trying to capture 3% of that market over the coming three years, during which we will launch or scale into the MENA region, which is a $1 billion market by itself. We're gonna launch with two main revenue streams, our publication, which is a pay-per-copy model, and our on-demand business-to-business research, which is a pay-per-response. We are a team of four. For me, I have over 13 years experience in marketing and sales management and leadership. Ahmed has led the operation of Epsos and Nielsen in the MENA region, while Iyad led the, operation, the, led the data analysis team in Nielsen also. Omar has led and taught and educated technical teams in different countries over uh, platforms such as Udacity. Our vision is to democratize knowledge through data. So if you want to help us, help us by mentorship, by building our network, and by investing 150,000K over the coming year and a half. Thank you very much. Thank you. Crowd poll uh, from Palestine. And so far, almost every company was from a different country, uh, which is quite unique in um, pitches like this or accelerators like this. So, yes, Marina. Yeah, hi. Thank you. Um, so, so, I Can guess the classic me? question so, someone's got to ask it. Oh, someone's trying to come through. Oh, it's you. Um, class question. Uh, so how are you going to build this community, this network of people who are going to take the surveys and engage and continue to grow that? Well, uh, thank you for the question. We're going to start with like the basic social media uh, and we're going to uh, engage all the social media influencers from the specific segment that we're trying to target. We anticipate that most of our uh, initial targets going to be youth, the youth sector who are looking or interested in the knowledge they get from uh, the data and uh, the fact that they get points and they get prizes. So we can, we, we're going to optimize or utilize the, the social media influencers in the region, which is uh, a growing hype, let's say, uh, to promote and market uh, uh, the app. In addition to the fact that inside the app, we're gonna uh, uh, integrate, uh, invite your friend. You get your po you, you get points for inviting him. He gets points for uh, logging in, uh, and partnerships. Of course, uh, we have uh, we have discussed partnerships with um, advertising agencies, media and broadcasting uh, networks uh, that will use our app for their uh, you know polls and statistics and uh, they can um, uh, convert some of their user base. Uh, okay, that's too long of an answer. 
So yeah, you're going, you're going to conquer the world. That's okay. Like, be perfect. We're, we're trying our we're trying our best. All right. Good. Well done. Does that answer your question, Marina? It has to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I know. I was just wondering. It's a challenge, but I mean, it's a big challenge you've got ahead of you. But good luck. Yeah, great. It is challenging. Thank you, uh, Timothy Barkai. Do you guys have any questions? Uh, what, what do you think your competitive advantage is over other others? Sorry, I didn't get the first part of the what question. What competitive advantage over others is? Yeah, so so basically in Palestine, we're the only online uh, platform for data analysis, uh, and we're trying to um, we're trying to uh, find a sweet spot in in countries where not much international market research agencies are tapping, and especially conflict areas such as Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Lebanon, uh, which uh, a lot of international companies are like scaring away from. We're trying to dig to dig deep in those. So uh, it's basically the market and the fact that, uh, you know, it's an online platform, which makes the whole process of data collection faster. Okay, thanks for the, thanks for the presentation. Yeah. Be safe going into all the conflict zones. And good yes. luck going forward. Right? Basically, we are, we are living in a conflict zone. I know, so, I know. Uh, I mean, I'm pretty <laughs> familiar. Yeah. Well, good luck. Masala. Thank you. You're welcome. So next in line, we'll have Med Stud Games. Hi, my name is Azhar with Sultan and Abdurrahman. We are from Med Stud Games. We are preparing future doctors in the new normal era. We are medical students ourselves, and we face many problems. First, we are getting kicked from the hospital so we can't see any patients. In the new normal era, we will see lesser patients. We also have very boring and long medical lectures. It is also hard to grasp the important information in clinical cases. The solution that we would like to offer is simulate clinical patients using bad size content and using the clinical cases essential information. So the market in the world, currently more than 11 million medical students, and there are valuation more than 80 billion US dollars. Here is the competitor. However, we have multiplayer features, but size content, and simulate patient digitally. So the features is simulate clinical cases, clinical patients in real-time multiplayer, or solo learning sessions. The traction, currently more than 500 users, so they say, Engage lecture and to create high quality discussion discussion session rather than one side boring lectures. And at November we got appreciation from International Conference of Medical Education. The business model is premium content subscription. And here is our team. We have been together for three years with software developments, business marketing and branding experiences. So what we need is 100 US dollar to achieve growth more than 20 percentage per month. In the end, it will have 11,000 users and 13,000 US dollar per month. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar, for the presentation. Tess, do you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I hope you can hear us as well. Barca? Hello. Yeah. Uh, can you talk yes, a little bit about the, the product uh, from a technical perspective? Like, the, what? how does it do that, right? Like, I mean, I think it is a, you have uh, a valid pain point, uh, but like, how do you solve that? Uh, you mentioned your medical, uh, it, it sounds like a computer science, uh, problem to, to be able to simulate a, a patient? Uh, have you done any work there? Uh... Sure. Uh, I have been developing software uh, in from since junior high school. So actually, uh, I have been programming since about 2009. It's really long years. I've been coding in Dart in Flutter framework from Google currently. Uh, the message game to this platform is using uh, Dart language uh, using Flutter framework and uh, yes, Asad, yeah, because it's Flutter framework, it could Asad. work both in iOS and Android. Asad. Sorry, 
Yes, yes. Slow down, slow down, slow you down. Is it the technical? Because we. Sorry, sorry. Yes, but slow sorry. down, slow down. Because we can't understand anything okay. if you speak that fast. So, Barkay's question is not okay. about the languages, sorry. but the competitive technical landscape. And slowly. Okay, so the technology. Uh, the technology that we are using is the Flutter framework. It's uh, from Google, and it is mm -hmm. uh, can can be exported into the iOS and Android platform without uh, extra coding. Uh, so it is in Dart language, and we are using the Google Cloud, the uh, Firestore uh, real time database, so that user can play it multiplayer. I have I am coding it uh, by myself, and uh, it's already available in iOS App Store and in the Google Play Store. Is that answer so, so the, the product is uh, currently available yes. in the app stores. Yes. So people can uh, use them for free. Like, uh, is that uh, like where where are you right now in terms of uh, 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 a, me a medical student can download and use the app? Uh, do you charge them now, or it, what what is the plan there? Okay, so currently a user can. Uh, get it for free but to register you must be a medical student there is a verification system there we are currently in user stage and we are not taking any revenue right now we are currently uh, resisting the best product for the medical students okay thank you and how much does it cost to acquire one medical student have you done online testing and user acquisition how much in term of money or in terms of dollars, in terms of dollars, uh, the the uh, the each user uh, is uh, will be expected to to be one hundred uh, about fifty to one hundred US dollar per month for for the uh, premium subscription. But for the fee, the server is uh, much l lower than that, so it could get profit. And how so, are you? How much are you paying to acquire the medical students? Oh. Oh, What's your marketing okay. cost per acquisition? Our marketing or in the future, maybe okay. not currently, but currently we are uh, doing a barter, uh, like uh, switching uh, effort. Like we are currently doing free marketing cost. Uh, I'm personally and my team is actually uh, one of the leaders in the uh, medical students associations, uh, medical schools association, and medical students organization uh, nationally. So. We are doing uh, better. We are. We will develop uh, their organization app, and they will uh, get will give us the marketing from uh, each medical school in Indonesia. Like that. So it's like uh, free marketing for now. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Timothy, Marina. Do you the, guys have any Steph. questions? Yeah. Yeah. Free, yes. what, do you, what, what do you see as kind of the key factor that will convert uh, the free users to paying users? What are the driving forces here? Okay. So the pain is actually about the looking for the study. We study a lot and we have actually used uh, really, really um, so many books and so huge books. And uh, basically in medical schools, uh, uh, we use our overseas uh, books in Indonesia, especially. But uh, medical schools in Indonesia uh, using very, very different uh, like guideline, and we are trying to provide the medical student with the right guideline, with the right uh, curriculum, because uh, medical lecturers are very busy and in hospitals, and frequently they are not uh, making the problem, uh, the problem for the exam themselves. So it's really hard for students to match uh, the, the, what they study and what the exam will be. So we are going to help them in the exam and uh, the skills themselves. So it could uh, in line with the uh, national doctor curriculum. So we help them in that. Is that answer your question? Uh, I didn't quite catch that, but th that's okay. We're for the sake of time. <laughs> uh, taking you. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Ozan. Take care. Welcome, everyone. I'm Yusuf from ALO. ALO is trying to improve the living quality of the blind people and their family members. Thus, ALO stands for AI for Least Observed. 285 million visually impaired people in this world, most of them belongs to the low to mid income group. ALO is addressing three critical problems of their life. 
fear of unknown, fear of left unknown, and financial impact. Often, a family member of a, a blind person needs to sacrifice his source of income just to provide assistance to for the blind person to lead a normal life. So it is not only one person who is getting financially impacted after becoming blind, it is always more than one. Allo, a virtual assistant in the form of an intelligent sunglass, which can see, listen, understand, and communicate is going to be the solution. With the built-in camera, bone conduction unit speaker, and uh, microphone, Allo can provide the visual information to the blind person. With the built-in telephony feature, the family members can feel always connected with the user. Allo is smart enough to understand the communication mode, whether proactive or reactive, uh, with both the user and the family member. Allo is GDPR compliant, and it's an ethical use of AI. Our design thinking process started by interviewing 500 blind people and their family members. Right now, 300 and uh, more than 300 people uh, are ready to pre-order. Allo can communicate with 17 languages, so it is truly a global product. So far, what we achieved in last nine months since our inception, we are patent pending. We have 100 units to be, pre uh, to be delivered by September 2020. We are building relationship with three NGOs who are working in this field. We have received funding from Bangladesh government and another Swiss agency to ma make Allo more compatible with French language. Along with me, there is Shia Marefin, the biotechnology bio engineer who is working closely with our prospective users. And he, she is also co collaborating with our another co-founder, Abu Kashem, who is leading the development team. Me and Sadiq Sarwar, we are managing the business and helping it to grow. Thank you. All right, come on. Uh, you are muted. Hi, can you Hi, hear me? Hi, Yusuf. Um, yes. Can you walk us through your pricing model and your projections for the next three years? Well, uh, my projections for next three years is approximately 6,000 uh, 6, units. And the pricing model is uh, one time uh, cost for the device, monthly subscription for the basic uh, operations. And we will be adding a kind of a marketplace for the users for the additional skills. For example, somebody wants to use social media uh, like, like that. We are mostly working uh, now with uh, a model of B2B. That means through the organization, those who are working with blind people, we are trying to uh, trying to promote promote this, not in fully retail. And what's your cost on margin? So, so that uh, device will be sold at three fifty euro at, the, at this at this price point at this at this moment. And uh, the margin is, uh, if we if we think of the device, the mar margin is approximately twenty five percent. Or due to the COVID, it 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 it, it may go down. <laughs> and uh, on the on the subscription model, our uh, mar mar margin would be uh, approximately uh, sixty percent after uh, putting three percent on the pledge. Okay, thank you. Timothy, have you seen anything like this, except for Google Glass? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was actually you, you beat me to my question a little bit. I, how, how do you see the com competition, and why are you better? I, I've seen some similar devices. Uh, well, if we call uh, think of head-to-head uh, -head competition right now, we do not have head-to-head uh, -head competition at this price point. There is there are two solutions which is in form of sunglass and uh, addressing the directly to the blind blind people, but they are kind of super expensive. We have to remember ninety percent of the blind people lives in low to mid income group. To compare, uh, for indirect competition like Google Glass or Hololens, 
During uh, some of our survey, we have uh, allowed our users to use that and uh, it got discarded very soon because those are not designed for blind people. Those are designed for us for a different purpose. All right. So thank you so much. Barca, do you have any question? No. Okay. Thank you. Ah, just oh, it's good. Wait, Sorry. Wait, wait a second. Barca is coming. You're muted, Barca. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll keep it short. Uh, follow up on Marina's question the, of the projection. Uh, I, I was just gonna comment that the, the value of the device that you present and your potential uh, projections don't match. In my view, if it does what you're describing, uh, in three years you would sell 60 or 600,000 of them, not not 6,000 of them. So they, they, this is just for future, uh, uh, like it is when you're re requiring fund, funding, it's not ambitious enough uh, to say 6,000 uh, of these. Again, like if it works uh, and there are, you know, you gave the market size, you can reach to a much higher uh, numbers and, and you should try to see uh, like, what it would take you to get there and look for partners there uh, investor as investors we would be far more interested in uh, getting involved uh, if you see a path to do like 10x of what you're describing uh, in, in that time frame so in general for the uh, startups not just you uh, uh, I, I would recommend a lot more ambition I, I'm not I agree, I agree. And I think uh, my Jedi skills is working because I assumed from an investor's perspective, there was this problem and I really appreciate you, you put this across. We don't have too much time for the answer to this, but I encourage you to reach out to the judges and me as well, because I agree, if it works, it should cost more, you should sell more, maybe with a different business model. So we are moving into and good luck Just, uh, and congratulations on that one. So we'll be moving to the next slides. Hi, this is Dew Grocery. It is the first online grocery e-commerce in Borneo. And these are the founder and co-founders of Dew Grocery. I'm Mr. Naimur Layasi, the founder of Dew Grocery. This is Mohamed Tarek Hassan, the co-founder. And this is Mohamed Mehdi Hassan, another co-founder of Dew Grocery. But the problem we are solving is the conventional tiresome grocery shopping and time wasted in traffic while driving to grocery parking problem, long queue while payment and worrying about the weight of groceries. The solution we are giving is the delivering the groceries at the doorstep of customers, easy online payment, mobile payment and cash and delivery from handpicking the fresh groceries for customers to delivering it where they want, we cover it all. The advantages is we give same day delivery, express delivery within an hour. Uh, they can buy groceries online from their comfort zone, no hassle or traffic on road, and they can save their money and energy and time. Service upon getting an order through our website www.degrocery.com, our staff handpicks the fresh groceries and deliveries and delivers it to our customers. The market, our current city is Kuching, Sarawak, Malaysia, which is in Borneo, in East Malaysia. Kuching has a total population of around 570,000 people. Our plan is to expand it to Borneo, which has around 21.3 million people. And after that, we will expand to Southeast Asia, which has 655 million people in total. Competition right now, we have h &L Express in Kuching, uh, in, in Sarawak, and Grab Mart also just came recently. But we are the pioneer in East Malaysia and Borneo. Business model is we get around 10 to 25 percent profit from product sale. And we also earn from delivery fee, but in future we are planning to get advertisement fee for any newly uh, launched product. Validation and traction, we launched on 8 November 2019 and since then we are continuously growing very fast. We have around on average 40 to 50 orders per day and we have returning customers and if it continues like this, we will have US dollar 1 million revenue per year in 2020. Graph of growth for last six months, you can see uh, from December, we gradually uh, had a very lovely growth and it's really um, nice for us as a startup. Investment opportunity, we are looking for around uh, USD 1 million for 10% stake. 
40% for marketing, 40% for operations and logistics, and 20% for research and product development. This is my contact. Thank you so much. This is my contact. Thank you so much. So, good. Hi. Uh, I'm happy that your business is growing, but I'm also sad that it's growing because of the virus. And Timothy was kicked out of a room and is now in a different place. Yeah, I know I got kicked out of the conference room, but I had yeah. a, I, <laughs> I, I had a question about the, your yeah. traction. What is your traction in terms of revenue? I, I think you gave it in terms of orders. Yeah, I gave it in terms of orders, but uh, in last six months we had revenue in total sales. It was around two ninety-two thousand uh, US dollar. So, sorry, I didn't catch that. How, how, what was thousand it? or two hundred thousand? Two hundred ninety thousand dollar US dollar. Right. Okay, over the last uh, six few months. Uh, and it increased. Um, mainly it increased in like from March uh, until uh, this June, like is when the revenue? lockdown. Is it revenue is it or the transaction value? Transaction volume. Totally. Yeah, the the total sales volume. Okay. Not okay. the total transaction, but your fifteen percent yeah. commission is three hundred thousand dollars. No, 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 no. That the total transaction is yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's what I was trying to make clear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Marina. Yeah, I mean, what does this look like in three to five years? How, how are the competitors going to come in? What are they going to do? How are you going to be the winners? Yes, please. So how are, you going to com how are you going to compete with the large companies who already raised more than hundreds of millions of dollars? Yeah, they are basically, I, I don't have any that much big competitors here in Borneo itself. Uh, recently, Grab came. And in other Southeast Asia markets, they are Happy Fresh and other companies are there. But in Borneo, we are the, um, before, before the lockdown even, we were the uh, uh, pioneer, we were the first online grocery here. So we already got our market share here. And then our plan is to, I've already gone to the 10 cities of Borneo itself. And I'm thinking that, yeah, we can do it. Because here we already got it and we have our customer base here. And we have our trust of the customers and we have the experience of, doing this business here and it was really successful and it is successful right now so we are planning that we can also at least conquer the borneo first and then we can go to southeast asia and this market is really huge so i don't think so a uh, few of the competitors will matter oh <laughs> uh, tell me about how you're tracking that trust how are you guys um really keeping a finger on that pulse of like being that trusted part being that trusted person to, um, for delivery in your region how are you tracking trust the thing is we have our own delivery like we uh, we we have built our own deli uh, i mean logistics so uh, we after getting the orders we have right now we have um, collaborated with the local supermarkets and then upon getting order we have our own logistics and we deliver it and we deliver on the same day and it's like uh, within two to three hours we have a fee for giving express delivery and we have also free delivery if we deliver in 24 hours are you seeing returning customers are you tracking mps scores yeah, are you yeah, doing yeah. What, what are you seeing there and, and the, the more important, I mean, the nice thing is that, you know, interesting part, I have only spent $4,000 for marketing for the last, um, you know, this three months. And then I have got a sales, uh, you can see the total sale was more than 90,000 plus. Then try so to spend really as much possible as you can before the fundraise to grow faster. So investors yeah, yeah, yeah. like Marika yeah, will be interested. I fundraise so that we can expand as quickly Thank as possible. You, because the market yeah, we know, we know, we know. We know. All right. That's, yeah. that's being established. So Baikai, is this a $10 million company? Probably not. We'll let you know when <laughs> Baikai, okay, he's, he's coming in. This, this, is, uh, this is a little outside my uh, wheelhouse. Oh, yeah. uh, so I'll, uh, I'll pass on you know, commenting. Uh, oh, but yeah, yeah like I, I would echo that uh, uh, you can underestimate the larger customers, larger competitors that can operate with zero profit for years yeah. uh, to push you out so you have to grow as quickly as possible and establish right. yourself uh, before that happens yes so we are all almost uh two-thirds of the way and we're moving faster uh thank you judges thank you for the participants uh it's been speeding up we're happy good luck to the next team
Hi, my name is Pavel. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Bagit, an international crowdshipping platform where users decide on delivery price. Of course, we all know that international parcels are being delivered globally without Bagit too, but it's expensive or time consuming or even both. Price calculation is so often non-transparent and they don't carry many kinds of items to so many countries and locations. Well, Bagit can do all of that. And in fact, Bagit already does that. Bagit was developed for one year and for first 10 consecutive months since launch, we grown on average to 30% each month by our key indicator of completed deals. For all that time, we didn't have a single team dropout. And here you can check our team. We do a lot to comply with legal requirements. Three legal entities in three countries are set up with bank accounts in recognizable local banks. Share capital of China legal entity alone is 150k US dollars. Our users can pay with eight currencies for their deals right on the platform using world's most popular payment systems. And those deals already happen in a vast geography, including China, Europe, Russia, USA, and even more countries. Even though we only have one global competitor operating in USA, South America, our market itself is just extremely huge. In 2018 alone, the world made over 4 billion flights. So in five years, we target to occupy 5% of those flights to deliver baggage parcels, where 1% of the market equals to 100 million US dollars in annual revenue. Thank you for your time. I'll be most than happy to answer any of your further questions. Thank you. Any questions? Marina? Maybe this is a, a bit of a okay. good question, but how, how do you keep people from just taking the packages, right? So where, where does the liability uh, sit? Pavel, are you online? We can't hear Pavel. Mm -mm. Pavel, you're not online. So uh, we'll move into the next startup if Pavel doesn't show up in like 10 seconds. But we'll make sure that you have the judges. Okay, Pavel is coming. Yes, I apologize. Hi. Hours, I heard the question though. Okay, great. great. Uh, so uh, basically, we got a very uh, complicated system existing currently. We have already 3,000 parcels uh, delivered and we have zero, zero stealth on the platform. Uh, so um, I could go into the, in depth about the stages of what we do. We verify users. We sometimes verify users by national ID. We have uh, different kinds of um, uh, escrow services on the platform that help to ensure the safe delivery and much, much more than that. But in general, I think our percentage of stealth or, 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 or loss it actually speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And then how much would it cost actually for an end user, you know, for the person ordering the package? So um, one of the good cases we had is delivery from China to USA for less than 24 hours for a price of around uh, 70 bucks, 70 US dollars, a parcel of, uh, I think five kilos it was. So uh, with DHL, it will be around 350 to 450 US dollars with UPS, something close to that. Okay, thanks. Well, should we go to the next one? If Marino or Barkai, you guys don't have any questions? Just trying to fasten it up because we, you committed some time and we don't want to overrun it as well. Good job, Baggett. Uh, tough business after Thank COVID. You. But I'm sure your muscles are straightened up now. Let's move into the next one. Good luck. Hey there, this is Sean. Few years back, my colleagues and I were working on healthcare automation projects where we discovered that the leading cause of death in hospitals are infections, claiming 11 million lives each year, and this number is only going to rise further. Now, medical technologies have advanced so much in the past decades, but still, 
immunity drops, immune system backfires, and infection still spreads. This particular condition is called sepsis, and recent studies have shown COVID-19 infections can result in organ failure, meaning that it is not limited to respiratory failure. So COVID-19 eventually leads to sepsis, and our current health infrastructure is way overburdened. So we came up with an intelligent solution. Meet Nostro, predicting sepsis using computer vision and artificial intelligence with high accuracy of 90.3% and only two medical staff required instead of eight. And what's beautiful is that Nostro can look six hours into the future of a patient's health. Now, Nostro works by acquiring high impact vitals and feeds it to its robust algorithm, which then predicts it in real time. And this data is collected using one of our devices called the Enver. And Deep Gnostics, our ICU management dashboard, is the representation of that data, where the red box indicates the severity of a person prone to sepsis. In addition to that, Nostro provides 24-7 real-time remote monitoring, patient prioritization, and high customization. So what ends up happening here? Nostro can save lives. And we see Nostro to be a fit for hospitals, insurance companies, and nursing homes. Also, the cost of treating sepsis currently is a whopping $50 billion each year. And we're offering 30% cost reduction using our deep tech. And this is how we entered the market. We have validated our B2B segment by signing three MOUs worth $540,000 with hospitals having capacity of 1,800 beds. And we are all set to launch our MVP this July. And these are the partners that have been working with us to achieve this milestone. And our team, having a combined 30 plus years of experience and 10 plus years of experience solely in the healthcare industry, is making all of this happen. And to achieve the next milestones, we are raising $800,000. So let's join hands to revolutionize healthcare. Let Nostro save lives. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. You're welcome. Uh, Marina or Barca or Timothy, do you guys have any questions? What are your what are your inputs? Are they actually your algorithm? Yes, we can hear. Yeah. So, so what are you actually inputting into your your algorithms? Did yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear. Okay, so uh, can you repeat the, the question? Sorry. So what are you using to input the system to generate the algorithms? Oh, okay. The device, you mean? No, the uh, data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what, yeah, what's your input data? Okay. okay, okay. So our input data is basically the six high impact vitals. That is basically uh, the vital signs that every ICU connect. We are mm -hmm. sort of. Uh, inputting that into our uh, algorithm and these are mainly uh, the model sorry these are mainly the uh, heart rate respiratory rate blood pressure diastolic systolic and uh, there is uh, the temperature of a person and spo2 which is the oxygen saturation and uh, most of that data is now collected using this variable that we designed and this is able to collect all of that data mm -hmm. and why is this approach better than a genomics based approach for example uh, sorry, which approach? Uh, uh, Genomics-based approach, or like a metagenomics, where you're looking at, you know, the uh, uh, bacteria in the bloodstream, for uh, like oh, DNA okay. with, with DNA sequencing. Okay, you, well, uh, uh, that is uh, something totally different. That's not something that we're doing. Uh, genomics is the totally the study of genomes. What we're doing is we're trying to predict the disease onset and before onset. Uh, using computer vision, which means that we don't have to rely on uh, lab reports. And uh, what happens with lab reports is that uh, essentially uh, lab reports take about 12 hours before turning in. And this is the golden time in which we need to predict sepsis or any uh, disease, uh, for instance, uh, so that the person does not go into or like the organs do not start deteriorating. That is why sepsis is such a big problem, because you cannot pinpoint it in time. All right. Good. Um, perfect. Then we can move to the next one. Or back up. Great. Uh, sorry. Uh, 
Sorry, we can't hear you. No, he's coming online now. Uh, if you can unmute. No, didn't work out. That's why I mean, like two headsets. <laughs> it drives me crazy. All right, Barakai will send me the question and then we can send it to you. All right, thank you so much. Good luck, guys. All right, Take that's care. Uh, that, that just showed oh, up. Okay. Yeah. The microphone the icon had disappeared for whatever reason. But uh, so I, I just wanted to basically like the, what the product does uh, did not come through. I think that Tim, Tim's question is that, but like when for patients in hospitals, you're giving a device and predicting the sepsis uh, without having to do lab tests. That's, that's what as I'm understanding. Uh, have you like how many how much data have you used and like uh, is do you have any evidence or like th that your algorithm works like with the you know in in real life tests or anything like that can you talk about that yeah of course uh, actually when we started we started using uh, data collected from uh, local pakistani uh, patients and then we combined that data with uh, uh, using data from uh, 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 EICs from US because uh, I know the demographics are a bit uh, different, uh, but the human physiology is the uh, same across all regions. And using that data, and there's a thing called transfer learning, we were able to uh, predict uh, the outcome uh, based on a test data. And the test data is something that the algorithm has never seen. And based on that, uh, we presented uh, the, the, uh, the metrics that we showed in the presentation were 90% accuracy, uh, which is specificity and sensitivity. So if like like there are 100 patients and uh, 10 have the disease so we are able to predict that uh, out of those 10 that the nine have the disease and previously right. this was not so possible especially in, in the your, market. in your next pitches as the inputs came in make sure you communicate this more effectively yeah i mean if, really you can, if you can talk about like uh, so many cases the, the sepsis was predicted x yeah. hours before it would normally happen uh, like that's the golden value that statement for you guys yeah. okay. and and it's there is a huge value for that uh, yeah. uh, i'd like to also, i mean it's it sounds great just to uh, you know and i'd like to see how that, like is it data gets to you and the you know or, or do you have to deploy to the hospital like uh, how, how does that work uh, but sure. uh, if it is with a single uh, device you can get this and, and do that it's, it seems very compact solution so looks very promising so we'll you. you work a little bit more and try to catch up with Barkai. Yep, perfect. sounds so good. Going, going <laughs> to the next slide. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Take care. Hello, everyone. Myself, uh, Faisal, CEO and founder of Selenius Technologies. Four years ago, myself and my wife, uh, another co-founders of Selenius, was managing an IT company together. It is an IT city with around 400 to 500 celebrations happen every week in different companies. And we had a problem to solve for ourselves. For all our celebrations, uh, we are only access to nearby restaurants in which food is not healthy and adulterated. So we thought to create an ecosystem of nearby homemakers who are passionate in cooking and thirst for the revenue. So Celebis uh, is a food tech marketplace for women to earn and uh, actually they can work from home. We call it as a crowdsource kitchen, expecting 100,000 women to join the group and 300,000 man hours per day with 10 million square feet of cooking space and thousands of varieties of dishes. Our business model was supplying from home to office, home to home, but to ensure daily steady revenue, we latest introduced home to shop model, we supply our products in retail outlets. Our early traction was quite promising with 75 plus corporate customers. 7,000 plus women joined and 15K USD revenue for first 150 days and expecting 15K USD monthly revenue from July 2020. The working style is that we receive order through app and chef get alert and they start prepare, preparing and our outsource delivery team will deliver on time. On the other hand, our next big step after successful POC in retail is Celebis Digital Shop a branded kiosk in every corner of the city, partnering with supermarket and high footfall area, which will recall our brand daily and bring daily business tractions. In this model for easiness and undisturbed 
supply. We source food from local central kitchen deployed by Celibis team. According to Indian food delivery forecast in 2019 to 2023, it is forecasted as 5 billion USD market. And Celibis with all three model, expecting 243 million USD revenue per year after three years. We stand completely ahead in our competition with our bulk order focus and celebration model and retail shops. But seems most of our competitors focus on daily meals and struggling with the delivery cost. Our team is highly capable with mix of technology, retail and growth hackers and growth strategists. We are asking half a million USD, 10% executive to expand operation to 15 cities for uh, spending uh, for operations, tech development, marketing and sales. Thank you very much. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Faisal. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Yes, yes. Marina, you've been silent for a while. Do you want to take this one? Hi, Marina. You're muted. Muted, Marina, yeah. Marina, Marina. Okay, hi, Faisal. Okay, uh, um, great to see this model. Really interesting to see the um, way that you've been able to empower women and to generate income. Is that the okay. a kind of core? tenant as you scale because it looks like you've shifted from the home into that kind of uh kiosk and um in-store baking or in-store cooking model no um, both does, models what, both what models are going parallel parallel uh okay. see see when we uh, plan to launch into new city we feel that actually uh, 25 to 35 kiosk in a city will give a uh, brand value from the ground so then we launch the on online then automatically uh, people, uh, the ground level people will know about the brand. So online model work uh, basically for pre-ordering and this model will work for the daily tractions. Okay, and uh, so what kind of growth are you projecting then? So if, if, assuming you succeed in this new um, path as well. Yes. Uh, what will uh, it look like in three years, five years and where will the revenue streams be and what would be your priorities? Next three years, uh, we are planning to go get into 15 cities, actually. So it's like uh, 30 to uh, 40 million USD business. That's what you're expecting for next three years. Yeah. OK, that's ambitious. Yeah. And now, we now we have in uh, we, we are only in 150 days and we are doing 15,000 uh, USD uh, with 150 days. And uh, we have signed a contract with the supermarket chain where uh, they are giving order for uh, 15,000 per, per month, 15,000 USD per month order from September onwards. Okay. Okay. Um, it's quite, you can have quite a diverse set of products. Um, what, what's your, what size team do you have? Uh, now we have around uh, six people and uh, delivery is outsourced to the third party. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. No thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Last right. two, last two of this batch. Good luck. Hang on. Cloud HPC helps you running your own supercomputer on the cloud. Hi, this is Bahadur, the CEO and the founder of Cloud HPC. I have a decade experience on advanced engineering simulations. John is my friend. He has a startup working on complicated multi-physics problems. One day he asked for help to resolve insufficient computing power problem, blocks him to make larger real power dynamic simulation for a car park. The only solution was HPC cluster. But HPC was for big guys only. He would lose the job or he would take the collapse risk. The solution we found was using the cloud resources. However, it was very difficult to set up and manage this process as well. That's why we developed Cloud HPC to solve all these deployment and management problems. With Cloud HPC, you have your own supercomputer ready in one hour. Our software is designed to integrate with the existing leading cloud platforms. It manages all provisioning and deployment process and auto scale the system to decrease the cost. The overall HPC market was reported as 27 billion in 2018, and it's expected to be 44 billion in 2023. 
Today, customers are spending more than 1 billion per month for new HPC servers, and it's expected to reach the almost 2 billion per month in 2023. With our software, our goal is to redirect these spendings to cloud by solving the customer's cloud platform problems. We have two different revenue models to serve various customer segments, SaaS model and on-premises subscription model. We are very competitive with especially the data privacy we provide with dedicated environment feature because data security is the most important concern for the customers. We have established a partnership with Alcazar Engineering, which was a startup at that time, and they could get many, many advanced engineering projects as a startup with the capabilities they get using uh, Cloud HPC. We have a great experienced team with passion to solve this problem. We are asking for the $1 million purpose of improving our product and entering the market with competitive features. Thank you very much. Good one. Thank you. Um, I had worked with a startup uh, recently that's doing um, supercomputing on demand. Uh, I'm just trying to. I forgot the name of it. I'll tell them, tell you the name. It's not Nomad. It's not Wirekit. It's not Quantum Solutions. So my suggestion will be go and search Unit X. That's a pretty uh, recent startup doing a similar thing, and they raised a good amount of funding. It's a great um, opportunity for uh, utilizing this uh, computing availability on the cloud. Uh, Bahadur, I can't see you, but I'm not sure if you're there. And I think this startup is something that Barkai would question a little bit more, or Timothy or Marina. See, Barkai is already great. <laughs> but I, I don't, I don't think he's here. Is he? Bahadur, are you connected? That'll be a shame. If not. Okay, he's coming. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I couldn't find the buttons. Yeah. Hi. No. <laughs> I bought like, it. You should be able to find buttons. You're doing super computing. So. Yeah, actually. Uh, <laughs> Next time. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll yeah, used to Zoom somehow. Yeah, you know. Some, okay. Nice to meet you. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the quick questions about the. Uh, obviously, as Ozan said, like there are others. Uh, so there seems to be a market. I'm not familiar with like who typically needs this type of uh, service, like the supercomputer service, but it. it there is indications that there are so the, but the, who they are uh, dictates how you can access them uh, like how you're going to acquire them basically this is this a uh, do you you know envision this as a sort of a product led thing that uh, people are yeah. searching for this and find it or will you have to go and sell to the large enterprise have you thought about the go to market model for this yeah actually that's the most challenging part for us because the market is uh, in US and Europe, may, and mainly uh, also we have some China also have very much improvement in this area. Uh, so the yeah the most important problem we should we should be established in the US market, yeah in at the as a beginning because uh, uh, the the large segment the large part of the customers are based on us because it depends on the research and development activities in the countries so uh, somehow we would like to actually we are, is how are you going to reach to those markets have you done any work on that uh we couldn't actually yet because uh, we couldn't reach them yet the problem is you know uh they the, these customers should be using this system for their very private data. They, ha they yeah. have research and, and legally you should be established in, uh, you know, uh, legally protecting country. You so should be US based. I'll, I'll, yeah. help you. Yeah, I'll, I'll help you with some of the challenges that you have and maybe answer some of them. So we can, yeah. I can help you answer some of Barkai's questions, but we're not going to have too much time on that piece. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, Timothy, Marina, if you guys good. have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. It's on me. I mean, I, I, I jumped on the gun here, but. That's all right. Yeah. I, I think for the sake of time, no questions on my end, but thanks. All right. Thank you. So really the last one. Thank you, Bader, for Thank the you. presentation. Uh, much to improve, but we'll figure it out. So the last presentation of the day, Arabigo. Hello, dear audience. People face difficulties finding an efficient way to learn languages and struggle to master the right pronunciation. They also feel uncomfortable, embarrassed, and stressed while practicing a new language in real time. Arabigo is a fully rounded resource for learning Arabic, combining video tutorials to facilitate the reading, writing, and speaking practice in full conversations. Its platforms accelerate syllables defects detection by using artificial intelligence to overcome common speech pronunciation barriers and inappropriate patterns. Our solution is based on an AI-powered mobile app that converts Arabic audio into recognizable syllables and offers the users a new customized vocabulary path. I'll let the numbers talk that simply shows the high potential that could rise behind Arabigo. Arabigo addresses a massive market opportunity, starting with 10 million immigrants in Europe, planning to expand to 3.5 million descendants in US, and targeting the 60% of the 9 million expats in Gulf countries in a long-term vision. We are building a two-sided market. The first revenue stream for B2C based on a monthly subscription starting from 6.67 euro per month. The second stream is for organizations based on the number of subscriptions starting from 45 euro per year. Similar solution providers are summarized in this table. But what makes us really different is the diversity of the content we offer for both ends and the fact we target a different market segmentation. Arabico is simply an innovative, efficient and affordable solution where the user pays less and gets more. Beta version to our users in August 2019 enabled us to collect 3,000 downloads, 650 subscribed users with an average note of 4.5 in the store and over 100 website visits per day, which puts us to launch the Android version in March this year. Here are the co-founders behind Arabigo, a group of mission-driven entrepreneurs who combine between a range of management skills and technical expertise, which is the main key of balance and harmony of our team. Thank you very much for your attention. Please have a look at our website and enjoy using our product. Hello. Hello. Good to see you, Anar. And I was hoping to see Mariam because I think I met her somewhere in my yeah, video. Yeah. Good. Yeah, she told me, but she wasn't able to do it. No worries. I wish you were alive uh, four years ago when I was in the Middle East where I couldn't find anything to learn Arabic. But maybe now if you send me a code, I can start learning <laughs> Arabic from you. It's going to yeah. be interesting. Could so, be Marina, are you interested in learning Arabic? Well, yeah, um, I, I am actually. So I'm, but I'm more curious about the money to be made. So tell me, what have you guys seen in terms of cost acquisition costs, um, lifetime value? Because you have some traction there already. What's it looking like? Yeah. So for downloads, we are now for one euros per download, but about four euros to have a subscription paid. Uh, let's say for a recurrent user. So this is in France. But uh, we are planning also to expand in Germany and other European countries and also in Gulf country. But this is a, a market that we haven't uh, reached yet. Test, 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 test every yeah. market and spend the money where the market is paying you the most. Yeah. You already you said your unit economics positive already. You're paying one euro to get four euro to download and turn the seven euro paying customer. So just spend every money, sell all your books, all your cars, and just dump it in the product. <laughs> well, probably it's not the right way to do it. But my guy will have a better, but I'm just kidding. My guy will have a yeah. better final Yeah, the issue, but with coronavirus, we were we, we had to, uh, to, to offer our lessons for free for this uh, whole uh, period, like all uh, educational uh, companies 
have done, but for now we are really trying to 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 monetize again. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, I mean, I think that there are there are two things. Uh, the one is that obviously the the product working better than you know the, uh, being effective in, in in teaching Arabic will be will be key, uh, and that's the customers whether they are even if they are free. If you can convert them to success stories, it'll, it'll pay uh, you know down the line. No, it, so it's not a problem. I wouldn't worry about not getting the cost, but the the one. The ones that pay validate that continue to pay i would say especially validate that the product works so, so like for investors it's not the money that you're getting from there it's that the, the people are willing to pay it, it will it, it tells okay. us that uh so uh, and, and especially if they continue but uh, as ozan said like uh, one of the things is that uh, to get 100 users it might be uh, one euro but if you're trying to get 10,000 users, what yeah. the cost will be will be very important. So, like, yeah. how how does the cost scale? Uh, you know, if you stay in one market, uh, uh, you know, that's something that I think you should find out. Uh, it will immediately be important for investments. Yeah. So, uh, guys, reach out to me, and I'll, I'll talk to you more. I know this is the yeah. second one I'm jumping the gun at, but. I, I failed at learning Arabic. That is one of my biggest re regrets in life. I lived there for three uh, years. Expect, expect, expect networks are very important. Like uh, every place we go, we have to learn something. And uh, yeah. if I can learn something, you know, just the basics in, in a like, you know, short amount of time, I'll pay yeah, like 10 times that. Like that's not, uh, that's not that much money. So, uh, you know, marketing, like customer acquisition is the, going to be the most important part of your business uh, success yeah okay. also we are also a technological uh, startup because we are also analyzing you know pronunciation data because the goal also in five years is to have a consistent speech recognition arabic uh, api yeah. not only speech to text but that also can understand uh, because Different of the specificity dialects. of yeah yeah dialects are a must yeah. yeah. Really funny story to end the demo day. I started learning before I went to Saudi, but I didn't know I was learning the Egyptian dialect. So I went oh, to Saudi okay. and I said, <laughs> <"It's Zayik." laughs> uh, and everybody was laughing their asses off because that's not how you say it. It's Arabic, but you don't say that in Saudi. So I said, yeah, okay, yeah. I give up. So that was the end of it. Thank you yeah. so much for honor. You're welcome. So I wanna give the floor to the panelists uh for the judges to kind of give a small overview or short overview of how they saw the first 17 first the, this first batch uh, if you have any general ideas or suggestions to the next day presenters or to these startups we'll appreciate maybe starting from sorry starting from marina if you have any final departing thoughts some advice we'd like to hear that uh, yeah, wow, thank you everybody. What an incredible selection of um, companies and um, potential. Um, I think the main thing is really like, I asked the same question 10 times because I'm so interested in finding out like, what's your what's your plans? Where are you going with this? What, what, what kind of traction should we expect? What kind of traction are you seeing? So if you have data, share it. Um, whatever it's telling you is vital to us understanding where you're at and where you can get to, even if it's not positive it's probably telling you something important that we want to know about. Um, so yeah, share what you know about where you are, what you've, how far you've come and where you want, where you need to get to and the challenges you see and how you're gonna come past them. Because I mean, we, we believe in your innovation, so showcase it. I agree, perfect. So where you were three months ago, six months ago, where you are now, what are the challenges ahead, where you will be going and how we can help you. Uh, yeah. which business model are you testing? So those are yeah. really important for especially investors looking forward for ideas to fund their teams to fund. Thank you yeah. so much. Super impressive. Thank you, everybody. Like amazing. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And please bring our weather back. I think London is having a greater weather than Istanbul. We're just raining outside. I don't <laughs> like it. Yeah, so, we got really good weather right now. I'm yeah, it's hot. Knock on wood. <laughs> stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks for your time. Timothy? If we haven't lost you, if we have lost you, we can go ahead with Barkai. Maybe final thoughts, some advice. 
sure I'll go uh, in the meantime. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the, there is a common theme in terms of if you have a history, showing that history helps us project the future. If not, uh, you know, you, you can focus on the problem and then where, where do you see the, the uh, your leading uh, and, uh, you know, putting yourself uh, in, in terms of like in the shoes of the investor, I think is a good way to get there. Like the, you know, w w what we're looking for, uh, you know, the, the growth rate, potential growth rate, right? Like if the, if the growth rate is not there, uh, it's not a, a suitable for an external investor to, to come in. Like it might, you might still have a successful business. It just won't be uh, yeah. through a, a external investment. So the, th those the questions, as Marina said, like the, it's, it's often the same ones, like how many customers you have, how, how are you acquiring them? Uh, a lot of them are to understand the unit economics, like the, if there is money invested in it, uh, would would it help with the, uh, uh, you know, that's one of the questions that we're trying to answer, right? Like, uh, whatever you're asking or more, would it accelerate would the growth? Uh, like, would it get to somewhere else? But how, how would that work uh, is important. It's typically uh, not easy to answer, but... Uh, uh, in most cases, the like we're gonna use the the the, the raised ask uh, for marketing, sales, engineering, like it's everything, uh, and that's typically not not that helpful. Like the where where would you like uh, to be more specific? Uh, choosy would would be work better from that. Like the, you have the product and you wanna scale the growth. You still have to finish the product. It's for that. It's okay. Like the. Then I'm gonna go. You know, six months later, I'm gonna go to the market. It's fine. Everything is a little bit same as as nothing. So, uh, like, it, it will be more uh, useful to focus on something for the next steps that you're raising. The amounts are not that high, so it's fine for like I'm raising for this for just for the next six months or twelve months to do this. Uh, would be a, a more uh, clean ask in, in my view. Perfect. Really nice. Um, I mean, I, I agree with both of your points, especially the startups, I think, should also understand how the investors think. Writing down a figure and asking for 250, 150, 500, that figure is meaningless to the investors. They want to know what will be achieved with the amount you're asking from the investors. And when you look at from that sense, you're making a mistake by saying, I'm going to spend 30% here, 500,000 here, 30,000 here. We don't, we don't care about that part, but you have to understand what will happen if you spend $30,000 on marketing is the answer we want to hear. We want to know, you know, what will happen if you spend the money, not where you will spend the money. We're not your parents. We're not going to ask you, where did you spend my money? We're going to ask you, what are the results you promised me? when you spend that type of money. That's the more important. I think that requires a different lens. You need to think from the investor's side, not from uh, a founder's side who is in charge of spending the money. Uh, I think that's a really key lesson for the startups. Some of them did a good job. Some of them can have some rooms to improve. But I think it's um, with the time passed for 17 startups. And thank you so much for uh, Barkai and Marina for being here. And Timothy had to leave, unfortunately. Um, and uh, I'll leave the floor to Burak and Elif to kind of wrap the session up and hope to uh, see some of the startups taking advantage of this opportunity to pitch to global investors. Ozan, thank you very much. Uh, Barkai and Marina and Timothy, thank you very much as well. It was a wonderful day for the, uh, these uh, lots of startups from different countries. Uh, I mean, it was, I think, valuable to all entrepreneurs and founders as well, not only pitching on stage, but also getting feedbacks and uh, valuable questions from the investors. And we will hope to welcome all of you uh, tomorrow uh, for the second demo day as well. And uh, we will broadcast streaming uh, at the same time tomorrow. Thank you, Burak. Thank you, Elif. Well, well done, thank you very much. Take good bye care, bye. guys. Love you. Bye-bye.